Hello and welcome to today's exciting session. It is from Pickleball to Piano, a discussion about learning, competition, and mastery. And I'm thrilled to introduce the one and only Stacy Rose, who is a concert pianist and composer. And she has performed worldwide in seven continents in solo recital and featured guest artists with orchestra, as well as playing at Carnegie Hall three times, two of them being complete sellouts. Please welcome Stacy Rose. Hey, Thanks. Stacey. Hey, thanks so much for that uh, very stellar intro. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce the one and only Angelo Rossetti of the Rossetti Brothers, pickleball and mental skills master professional. Angelo is a three-time Guinness, Guinness World Records title holder, two in tennis and most recently in pickleball. I have no idea how you did that. Uh, and does all this with his identical twin brother, Ettore. Uh, the two of you are very identical, except for the mustache, which Ettore has, thankfully. Yes. <laughs> so uh, just to set expectations, this session is going to go about an hour. We're going to go back and forth with ideas. Stacy on the music side and the piano, me on the sports side, particularly pickleball. And how we've come to today is we've worked together for a little bit over a year, Stacy and I. And I feel like I'm lucky enough to have uh, Stacy as a player that I coach. I, I'd say I don't give her lessons. I, I coach the, the athlete and the person first, and then the pickleball player second. And many sessions, We've had synergies, ideas, and breakthroughs on the music side and the sports side. So rather than keep those breakthroughs to ourselves, we wanted to enrich you with our insights that we found along the way. So we hope you find value in this. We certainly look forward to feedback. You can always email me, Angelo at RossettiBrothers.com. That's two S's and two T's in Rossetti. Okay. So with that said, one of the things as a pickleball coach that I start with is that I say, we're typically gonna cover three areas, handwork, footwork, and mind work, typically in that order. And when I say mind work, I mean tactics and strategies. But what I realized is that everything needs an overarching mental skill. And when you apply the mental skills from day one with handwork, technique, and movement, then you don't have to memorize it. It stays with you. And so starting with that, Stacy, with pickleball, typically in the first lesson when I'm assessing the player, I assess the grip. And typically, you know, you want to hold a continental grip, you know, with the base knuckle of your index finger on panel number two. We won't get too technical, but I assess the grip and I go into them needing to control their controllables. And one of your controllables is your grip, but the other is your grip relaxation. How loosely do you hold the paddle? So I developed the three, two, one method where you're not judging the player or the outcome, but you're just giving it a fact of what the number is. Three being optimal, two being needs some improvement and one needing a lot of improvement. So with grip relaxation, I would call this a three, then holding it loosely a two, and then the death grip a one. Sorry to be gruesome there, but most players are between a one and a 1.5 or two when they're first starting out because when you concentrate, then you grip tighter. And so I say be at three because then if you go to two, 2.5, you're okay, but you want to focus on being at a three. So on that end with the grip relaxation needing to be a three, I want them to feel 
what it feels like to have a three, a two, and a one so they know the difference when they're actually playing. And in piano, what would the correlation be there? Well, so just to backtrack a second, um, when we first started working together, I think I drove you crazy saying, oh my gosh, that's exactly like what I work on in piano or uh, when I'm working with dancers. And so I'm really glad to have this opportunity to talk about the, the numerous parallels and overlaps between, I think, sports, all sports and music. And yeah. just seeing a skill. Um, so as far as the three, two, one, that's very similar to what I do. Um, I, when I'm teaching or playing and practicing myself, I break things down into like three stages, three steps. Uh, for me, the first is understanding or uh, conceptualizing or sometimes composing the very first yeah. uh, canvas and understanding it. Sometimes I do that away from the instrument. I'll go for a walk in the park and think about the architecture of a given piece. And uh, then step number two would be learning or memorizing, which I actually play games with myself about. Um, everyone says to me after a concert, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're doing all that from memory. Uh, memory is a muscle and you have to exercise it. So I play games, you know, teaching myself to memorize more. Uh, so that's the next stage. And when I do my own, when I play my own compositions, people think, well, you composed it. So why do you have to learn it? But while I'm composing it, I'm seeing if it works in a natural pattern in my hand, but I haven't actually learned it. So that's step two. And then step three for most musicians is performing. And sometimes I only get, if I'm playing as the soloist with orchestra, sometimes I only get one or two rehearsals before showtime yeah. and it's pretty nerve wracking. So what I do to prepare is I do what I call run throughs where I play for, you know, some uh, compassionate audiences as I'm playing the first or second or third time of a piece or a, a program. And um, while I'm doing those, while I'm preparing for the performance, I'm always kind of testing myself and thinking back to, okay, performances where I played my absolute best, what was going on? What was the atmosphere? What did I do? And I try to reconstruct, recreate that. So definitely a three-step process for me as well. And well, that's great. Just one more thing I was going to say. Um, I think dancers are the exact combination of what we're talking about today because they are athletes, absolutely, and they're artists. So they're really combining the skills that we're talking about today. So that's great. So then let's talk about mental calibration, physical calibration for a second. So there was a study done, and it was with bean bags tossed to the cornhole and there were two groups and there was group a and group b group a practiced 10 feet away from the hole and then group b practiced only five feet for half their shots and then 15 feet and then both teams competed against each other just at 10 feet so rather than quiz the audience because a lot of people get it wrong they say, well, of course, it's going to be the the team that practiced from 10 feet the entire time that would have won the competition from the distance of 10 feet. But it's the opposite. It's the team that what I call mentally and physically calibrated. So they felt what it was like to miss short. They felt what it was like to miss long. And then your mind knows the difference and identifies the middle so that each mistake or miss leads you closer to success. Whereas when you're just going for that pinpoint bullseye of 10 feet, your mind is not prepared to assess any data from the miss. It's either a miss or a mate. And 
when you know if you miss short, then you need to go longer. And then when you miss longer, you need to go shorter. So what I have players do is miss long on purpose, miss short on purpose, then try to go for the middle, then miss longer, but shorter, longer, shorter, Ooh. but longer, shorter. And then in the middle, eventually those three points converge. I call that mental and physical calibration. Is there anything in the music world that you do in that regard? Uh, everything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really, it's 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 identical. Um, when I'm practicing, I absolutely have to practice at different speeds. So we call that in music tempo. So I have to practice extremely slowly before I can even play a piece fast. I break it down oftentimes to left hand alone, right hand alone, because I can't play it together until I can solidly play each one separately. Separately, So I'm isolating uh, certain parts of the piece and then I integrate it. And so I practice at extreme tempi, uh, mm. meaning very, very slowly. Mm. And then and then at the tempo that I'm actually going to play the piece and then much faster that I'm going to play a piece because then much like your example, then the real tempo, the actual tempo that I'm going to play seems easy. So that's calibration. And yeah. um, also I, in performance, I calibrate every single thing in live time. So I have to adjust uh, you know, if I had a memory slip, it happens. And I have to think about what went before this and what I'm doing right now, and then try to adjust accordingly. Can you show an example of what you just said right now? Of uh, going slow and then fast and then where you want sure. it? Sure. I'm not going to do an example of a memory slip, though. No, no, no. We'll, we'll <laughs> keep that one out. We'll keep that one out. Just kidding. Yeah, that's sort of like every performer's nightmare. I forgot my <laughs> I forgot a note. So, and also with that, uh, it's very difficult when you are playing with a hundred piece orchestra supporting you, accompanying you. There's not a lot of room for mistake. So again, mm -hmm. if I mess up, it's on me to yeah. adjust. So as far as the tempos, let's see. Um, so a Bach piece, let's see. So I would play that at really slow tempo and also left hand alone. And then maybe like. That's way faster than I will actually play it. But um, do I have my metronome around? No, I don't have my metronome around. But so I um, use that as kind of what you do to yeah. students when you're coaching them to make myself stick to the exact rhythm. Well, I love that. So that then is a direct correlation with what I coach with the pickleball serve is depth for for those pickleball players out there, the strategies of three Ds, serve deep, return deep, and dink. You need to have your serve deep so you keep the returner team back as long as possible because once you all get to the net, you have an even chance of winning the point. So what I do is I make players serve long on purpose but with the same swing, the same swing path the same grip and technique, not a wild miss, but a controlled miss. And I find with some players, they can't do it. They don't allow themselves either mentally, mentally or physically to miss the serve long because they say that's a mistake. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I'm trying to calibrate their mind so they know what true depth is. And what I've realized, Stacy, is that if you can't on call hit your serve out, then you're not serving as deep as you could. That reminds me of the range in speed of the piano. You're getting them to play it faster so they can get it 
where it needs to be. And so what I say is when you have a specific goal and the goal we just talked about was serving the pickleball deep, you need to tie it to an acceptable miss that will get you better. So if you're aiming deeper, you need to accept that long is an acceptable and productive miss, but not wide and long. That's not acceptable. Definitely not in the net. But if you miss long, and so in some of my clinics, I force the the mulligan on if you have a second try, only if that first serve was long. And that way you get the player and athlete to accept the mistake. It's striving for excellence, not perfection. And what are your thoughts on that as relates to the piano or music? Well, I think it's human nature not to want to do something wrong you know so it's hard for us to say oh, okay i'm going to hit it way out our brains just say i want to i want to be a good student i want to do it right and um especially in the arts it's such a subjective endeavor so there's no right and um it's about interpretation and it's about um being sincere with that interpretation so it's very difficult to get someone uh, a student especially not to be concerned with getting a note perfect and only being concerned with technique uh the, our goal in music is to practice as they say practice 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 but practice with intention and efficiency that's so important you talk about that for sure with sports and in pickleball um and then also once you feel that you can play with more um efficacy and kind of are not concerning your brain with doing it right or with the technique it's kind of amazing how then you feel more free and then you open up and you can play so much more expressively so in fact, when I'm performing in front of an audience, if I'm thinking only about getting it right, or I don't, or I hope I don't have a memory slip, I have to really calibrate my thinking more positively. And yeah. also for me, anyway, I get words out of my head. I just start thinking about what I'm hearing, what I'm listening to, and be in sort of hyper acute listening mode. Well, I, I love that. Um... In an analogy that comes to mind uh, with my three, two, one method, I, you know, use that to remove judgment and to help with uh, progress, quicker progress is you use your senses to, to figure things out. And so kind of like you were just saying there, you know, not overthinking it. So, you know, uh, typically hitting the ball on the sweet spot is probably the most important thing for a consistent pickleball player, you can have the best technique and strokes in the world, but if you cannot hit the sweet spot consistently, you won't get a consistent result. And the sweet spot being on this center area, three balls where they would fit. And so we call that a three and then anything off center, a two, and then anything on that rim is a one. And what I do is I have the athlete hit a few balls at first, you know, and I have them report to me after each ball, whether they thought it was a three, two or a one, three being the goal, the center of the sweet spot Two needs a little bit of improvement and one more improvement because it was on the edge. And some people have difficulty with it. Some people pick it up right away. The ones that pick it up right away and able to report the correct number every single time because that again we're going to revisit control your controllables to call out the number with intent every time is 100 with your in your control and so those that use kinesthetic awareness how it felt are very accurate and that is the number one awareness skill in pickleball you need to develop for sweet spot hitting and then number two is auditory awareness it sounded solid or it sounded clanky you know and the third one is visual awareness and going into it, most people think they should be using their eyes, but if the ball is moving in one direction, you're redirecting it in another direction at close uh, quarters and, and the person is right in front of you, you will not have time 
to watch or track the ball all the way to your paddle. There's a 30% angle that's your blind spot and you have to trust that it's going to go there. So you don't actually use visual awareness for improving your sweet spot hitting, but you have to keep your head still as if you could. So I want them to keep their head still at point of contact because the head is the heaviest part of your body. And if you shift the head, the pickleball is very light, Stacy. That is going to go with where your head goes. So you need to keep your 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 head still. But those are the three awareness principles I use for better sweet spot hitting. How does that correlate with music? Um, again, there are so many correlations. Uh I think that uh piano in some ways is an easy instrument because if I just go up to the keys, I can play them. I can they depress and I and you hear a sound. And I think pickleball is similar in that most people can pick up the paddle and hit the ball, whether it's on the sweet spot or not, they can hit the ball and hitting it over the net is relatively easy compared to tennis or compared to other sports where you really can't even do it until you have a lot of mileage beforehand. So, um, but what's different is it's not just that it, you know, I can play the notes. Um, there's a million different touches. Well, probably not a million, but many different touches and techniques. And what's so similar to sports, and I'm so glad to have the opportunity to kind of um, articulate and codify this, uh, body mechanics. Body mechanics are huge. Um, we play very much from the arm. And um, of course, if you're doing something many hours a day, you better do it correctly, meaning wisely and take breaks and you don't want to be injured. So body mechanics are huge. And the other thing that I'm finding with pickleball, unlike tennis, is it's very loud. And so for me, I actually hear how the ball's going in certain rhythms. So for instance, when you were trying to teach me a third shot drop, I would hit it hard. And then yours would just take all the energy out of it, diffuse all the energy. So the sound of it is, but um, but um, that's a third shot drop. And it sounds very much like the um, Netflix thing when it first yeah. comes up but um so in music that's literally a 16th note with a dotted eighth note and that's so cool. i think of it in that terms and i actually so it's not so much pitch but very much about rhythm when i'm playing pickleball it's very cool because i really do hear not only when a ball is hit on the sweet spot exactly but also just so many other um auditory sensations that are really important so I, I love that. And, you know, with um, uh, Tim Galway and Inner Game of Tennis, and it's a, a book that has sold over a million copies and it has gone far beyond just the sport of tennis. You know, uh, Tim, when, you know, when I interviewed him, we had a discussion about this uh, with my book, Tenacity, and his book, Inner Game. You know, he talks about bounce, hit, bounce, hit the cadence of the bounce and the hit, it creates timing, it creates rhythm. It's almost like your opponent is also your partner in developing some type of rhythm, which is fascinating to me. I've kind of taken it to the next step and, and I do three, two, one, because I like the tracking to start before the bounce on your side. So I would say when you're hitting the pickleball, I would say three. And when it bounces on my side, two, and then I hit it one, or you can even do it converse if you want to time it with your hit. So you hit the ball, I say one. It bounces on my side exactly when it bounces, I say two. When I say three, I'm hitting it. And so there you can pick up the rhythm and if it's short hopping it or taking it what's called on the rise, it's going to be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. If it was a lob or you were slowing it down. And so that rhythm being in tune to that rather than just hitting the ball mindlessly, but making everything with 
purpose and timing. Yeah, absolutely. Timing um, is key, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and interestingly about timing, um, in music, some of the most powerful tools are rests and pauses and sometimes silence. So you can kind of, one can bolt through a passage and it's okay, it's fine. It's probably playing what's written on the page, but oftentimes we want to be much more expressive. So we will deliberately pause. And I'm always amazed to see that um, if I'm practicing something that's really difficult, like a skip, I will practice. I don't know if you can see the left hand or the right hand, but I will practice getting to a place and stay there and not depressing the note. So mm. in other words, um, I'm definitely teaching my brain and uh, hands to get ready for that. So as you I said, love that. I, as you I, said, I say, hurry up and wait, wait. all yeah. the time. So hurry I, up and wait. Yeah. So I literally get there and wait so that when I'm doing it, when I'm playing something at tempo, my brain knows to get there. And you always have more time than you think. Even somebody told me that the other day when they were doing the fireball drill with me on the court. And I was up in that and, you know, trying to block. And he said, you know, you actually have a lot more time to watch the ball than you think you do. So I haven't really discovered that one yet on the court. Yeah, and that one I learned from Yvonne Lendl this summer when we were training a few times a week and with pickleball, he's making that transition. And he just won a 5-0 gold in Florida with his partner in men's doubles. And he was a world number one player for many weeks. And, and he and I worked together for 10 years on a tennis court. And now it's pickleball. He has a passion for that. He loves the game. He's very good. And when I would flinch at his hard shots, when he would drive at the kitchen at close range, he said, what are you flinching for, Angelo? It's only going to make a mark. That kind of sat with me is that as long as you have that nine o'clock position out in front, you don't have to be afraid of it. And I think when you bring fear in, it slows down your reflexes. But when you just let it happen rather than try to make it happen, you actually have much more time than you think. And that, that is so important rather than flinching, excuse me, or pulling back, you know, just keeping it right out there. So, yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, conquering fear is a huge part of performance and, and probably a huge part of practice too. I think um, I'm just trying to encourage students to be glad they're doing this and, um, enjoy the process it's a it's truly a lifetime process be it an instrument or sports i mean you can always improve and so i think that uh you know it's counterintuitive to work on something so hard and spend hours and hours and hours and then just let it go when you're in a performance state to me that's one of the most difficult things is that it's so practiced I'm usually 200% prepared going into a concert, but then I have to just let it go and yep. see what happens on stage. And also I love um, what Lindell told you, don't be afraid. It's just, you know, so in my case, I miss a few notes, who cares? You know, the worst possible thing is I have a memory slip. It's yep. not going to change the world. Yeah. You start with the worst that can happen and then you make the best you make it the best of what you can make of a bad situation and, and you just learn from it. Uh, and I, I, I agree with that completely is you let it happen rather than make it happen. I know Tim Galway kind of says that a different Absolutely. type of phrase in the inner game, yeah. but you just let it come from within. And that is the more authentic way to play uh, rather than try to force it from the outside in. And, and again, that is your control, your controls. But yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt, but I was just yeah. going to say, he um, also in his books talks about focusing on the action itself, not the results of the action. And for me, that was so helpful, both in sports and in music making, because I get into this thing, well, I hope the audience likes it. And what if, and 
um, his idea of just focusing on the action itself is so helpful because then it kind of puts all distractions out of your head. You're just focusing on that one point or on this one phrase and each part of the action has um, an intention, as you say. I, I love that. Walk out. As soon as I walk out on stage, I have to be on and I have to know that it's going to be the best or maybe not that I can do at that given time. Of course, I'm going to hopefully be able to play something better in a week or two weeks or next year, but it is how it is right now. And same with sports, like you got to walk on with confidence, knowing that you're going to try to do your best. Yep. And what you were saying before about kind of what if the what ifs, the what if could be killers. And yeah. I learned, I, I did some mental skills training with Carly Lloyd and you know, she was uh, world number one uh, FIFA female soccer player of the year two years in a row before she retired. Yeah. And she is extremely confident. And she said there are no what ifs, mm -hmm. just what is, what is, it is what it is. So I always say hope is not a strategy. Mm -hmm. Hope is a belief that you have, but then you put it out of your mind. You can't anchor yourself on that. I hope I do well. And you can't judge yourself while you're doing the doing. And that's where Tim Galway in inner game, there's the two selves, the self one, which is the critic and the self two, that's a doer. You need to be a doer. Just go out there and do it. There's always going to be that, that devil on your shoulder. That's going to critique you every step of the way, but you're not looking for a lesson. You're looking for enjoyment and finding your flow state is tied to enjoyment, not the outcome. And I learned from Gigi Fernandez, who has 17 uh, Grand Slam doubles titles in tennis. She told me, detach from the outcome. She got that from Dr. Jim Lair, who's a world-renowned sports psychologist. But what I love about that is she made vibration dampeners, and it said detach from the outcome that she puts in her racket. So, you know, on the changeovers or when she looks down at your strings, detach from the outcome. Because what happens with the mind is when you get closer to the end result, it starts to future think. And if you're future thinking, you're not 100% engaged in the present. You could be 90 or 80 or 99, but it's not 100. So whenever you start future thinking, uh, which symptoms of that would be nervousness, anxiety, those come fear, those come from being in the future. And if you're thinking about the past or resting in the past and not present, that would be regret, frustration, or anger. But when you're in the present, you're not feeling those things. And so to keep players present, I don't tell them to say focus because when you tell yourself or a coach tells yourself focus, that's like saying, what's the meaning of life? Mm. It gets confused. You got to do something that will get you focused. So the yeah. senses don't exist in the future or the past. So I, I, I say three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. You slow down the cadence. It slows down your breathing. You do that after each point, especially when you're feeling nerves. And then those nerves dissipate and it brings you present because of this the touch, or you even use sound to keep you present. In music, do you use any of that? Yeah, definitely. Um, just as far as enjoyment, um, you know, even though these skills and endeavors are supposed to be for fun, we take them extremely seriously. And in my case, it's my profession. Um, it's really difficult to integrate fun with the intense concentration that these skills require. Um, so I try to, like you, um, remind myself to have fun in the moment. And um, for me, just keenly listening um, and, and immersing myself in these amazing, lush harmonies and sounds, knowing that I'm part of uh, giving others enjoyment, that's my greatest enjoyment. So I think if we can keep that in mind, um, actually, Tim Galway, 
wrote an inner game of music too. And that was like my Bible before going on stage sometimes, because it is about how you talk to yourself and what you tell yeah. yourself. Tim was definitely a pioneer. I remember when we had our discussion, I inspired him to pick up tennis. He hadn't touched a racket in over a year. And I inspired him with kind of talking about tenacity in the inner game that he went mm -hmm. and played again that next week before we talked again. I was certainly very humbled and flattered uh, that mm -hmm. I had that type of impact on on someone as established as, as Tim. But I go back to what you said about fun and enjoyment. And that is so true. And being a professional, what I realized is it's not about me. It's about everyone on the court enjoying themselves. And now when I play tournaments, whether I win or lose, it doesn't matter. It's not just, did I have fun? I go even deeper. I said, did my partner have fun? My, you Typically my, my twin brother, Etere. And then did each of the other opponents, whether they won or lost, did they enjoy the process? So what I find myself when I'm in my flow state is that I'm celebrating not only my good shots and my brothers, but my opponents. And I remember we had a great point. We lost the point, but it was such an amazing rally back and forth and so many dinks and smashes and gets. I go up to the net and I'm paddle tapping and the match is not over yet. And that's really when I'm at my best. It doesn't matter because I'm detaching from the outcome. It doesn't matter who won the point. That was a great competitive play, good strategies. And, and that's, what I love so much about pickleball is that camaraderie. Yeah. Um, so what comes to my mind, I think I may have mentioned this in one of my lessons with you was that Beethoven would uh, talk about being most satisfied after a performance, not because he played the notes correctly or because the audience went away really satisfied and happy, but because he would communicate what he intended to communicate. And I think there's so much overlap in just what we're talking about, um, going with what's happening at the moment and not being concerned yeah. with anything else and making sure that that's what you're excited about. So, which brings me to something you talk about a lot, which is um, gratitude and for me, that's a big part of uh, why I do what I do. Um, I feel so incredibly fortunate to be doing what I love doing and able physically to do it, mentally to do it. Um, I thank my parents for encouraging me and supporting me in this lifetime journey. Um, and I think when I'm out there, much like any sport when I'm sharing it with others, other like-minded people who share the love of a sport or the love of music. Um, sometimes I've been in foreign countries, like was it, I was in Ukraine many, many years ago, and there was no common language. I couldn't speak to the orchestra with whom I was sharing the stage and, and working on this performance, mm -hmm. but we communicated in this case through music so deeply it was really moving um so i feel like i have to um oftentimes realize that i am doing this not just for myself but i feel so um grateful to be giving something to others and hopefully bringing joy in what i do and i love that and gratitude is a big part of of what i coach as well if you are grateful for what you have, you are present. But once you have regret, you're living in the past, the what ifs. But it's mm -hmm. here's it is what it is. I'm so grateful to be here, to be in a physical or mental condition, to be able to enjoy and love the game of pickleball and share that with others. And you know that goes right. At, back to what we talked about controlling the controllables and I just didn't want to say it and not have an acronym so I I've combined as you know Stacy my my passion for wildlife photography particularly photographing wild bald eagles because there's not many of them but in our state of Connecticut there there are now um uh many sets of of, of 
uh, uh, bald eagles. There was they were on the endangered species list about ten years ago, and there was I think only one couple in the state of Connecticut, and now we're we're over fifty, close to a hundred. Um, but I use that acronym Eagles. Focus on your eagle. So when you have your camera and you're taking a picture of an eagle, you know it's effort attitude gratitude learning enjoyment sportsmanship and the seventh one i've added courtesy of my daughter maddie is freely playing freely those seven are the things or the seven key controllables in not just pickleball or tennis but any sport and if you focus on your controllables then the anxiety goes away and I find that the post match analysis becomes more accurate and fun because you can control those things and you might not win. You might win, but the outcome is not within your control. Unless of course you want to lose on purpose and miss all your serves on purpose, then you might be able to control losing, but you definitely cannot control winning. Hmm. Yeah, I and love so, eagles. Eagles F. And yeah, so if you can remember the, that acronym and the effort, attitude, gratitude, learning, enjoyment, sportsmanship, and freely, F for freely. And I even have, you know, players that I coach. What I do after a match is I'll write the grid in a spreadsheet and three would be, that's what my goal was. I can't do any better. Two needs some improvement. One needs a lot of improvement. Maybe 0. 0.5, it was non-existent or zero non-existent. And that is so important because when I do my numbers, my three, two, ones on Eagles, what I notice is in the matches and tournaments that I won gold, my, my threes were across the board. And when I didn't have threes in my controllables, I typically won silver or bronze. And it's just such a correlation between the outcome, performance, whatever, and the process. But if I can control the process, I might get a more desirable result. Um, absolutely. That pertains to what I was saying before about... Um uh what was i talking about with um the controllables just you might be irritated about something uh in my case it seems like every time before a concert the pedal sticks or the piano is not where it's supposed to be or the sound guy didn't show up um so i do think a lot about sportsmanship at the piano about music because i know that when i'm gracious be it to the audience or whomever, I, I feel complete. And um, if I'm distracted by whatever, candy wrappers or coughs or uh, things going on outside, playing in New York, there's sirens and babies crying during the most beautiful passages. Um, I really, really try to show appreciation for other musicians I'm working with, the audience, the ushers, the concert producers, and I also think that sportsmanship applies to ourselves. So as you said, evaluating your performance after a match. Um, I mean, it's really good to be self-critical. Anyone that is striving for perfection or mastery can definitely be too self-critical. And I think we also just have to be proud of ourselves for having the courage to get out there and do this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's an example of one of my my eagle photos here. This was one in Hamden, Connecticut, my hometown. And, uh, you know, you know, it, it's it's if you can. The more that you compete, the more pressure you take a step back and you just say, am I controlling the controllables? There's going to be a lot of distractions and and. In preparing for our second tennis world record, the longest volley rally, which still exists, 30,576 30, volleys without a bounce, according to Guinness World Records, um, and that took uh, uh, five hours and 28 minutes, is, you know, you don't have the luxury of 
any mistake. It was a one and done attempt. We were trying to raise a million dollars for Save the Children charity where my brother works. So it's a little bit different is that you have to focus on excellence to be anywhere near perfect. But if you focus on perfect, that's where the yips can come in. And so, you know, what I learned when you have a one and done, this is it, is that you have to embrace, not lock out distractions. So I came up with the the Elvis principle. And that principle is that if Elvis Presley, because some people still believe he's alive, if he walked into the room, he walked into the club and my peripheral vision saw Elvis, I told my brother, I'd say, oh, there's Elvis. That's nice. Stay focused. It was not going to phase me. And I told my brother, I had a code name, Elvis. So whenever the counter dropped the clipboard, the siren went off, the the for the emergency vehicles, the garage door went up in the middle of our rally, I would call out to my brother Elvis, which means stay focused. Here comes a huge distraction. And embracing your distractions, I found, helps you stay within flow state. But if you try to block them out, you use a lot of effort and energy. And here's the example, Stacy. Hmm. All right. So try not to think about a pink elephant. Go. <laughs> So of course, that's all I'm thinking. Did about. you think about a pink elephant? Of course, we all did. Yeah. yeah. So when you prompt your mind to block out something, it's going to think about it more. So that's why, rather than tell my students or players I coach, don't hit the ball in the net. You'll never hear me say that because they're going to hit the ball in the net because the human mind works with images, not words. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Let's do a real live example here. So when you think of an image, I want you to raise your hand as soon as you think of an image of this. So brown bear, raise your hand. Yeah, her hand went up. Yeah, on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Yellow elephant. When you think of that image, raise your hand. Okay, ready? Don't. Can you think of an image of don't? Don't. 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 Not really. The only. The only thing I think. The of Ghostbuster. Is. The Ghostbuster image is the only thing. Oh, don't okay. swim in that area. Yeah. And that usually takes people time, but notice how, how long it took you to even try to come up with something. Yeah. So when you tell your mind, don't hit in the net, it disregards the word don't. It doesn't remember that because it doesn't have the visual image of that. And it's left with hitting in the net. So, and also people don't like to be told what to do. Don't do this. Don't do that. As kids, we want to experiment. We want to expand our horizons. So so that the choice of words matter when you're coaching players, but also when you're coaching yourself. And is there a correlation there with, with um, music? Well, definitely a correlation about concentration. Um, there's a great story about Sergei Rachmaninoff, uh, one of the master Russian composers. And he was playing a concert. I think it was somewhere in Moscow and um, which is in the winter it was bleak and uh, extremely cold and the concert hall was packed um, and apparently this huge chandelier fell not on the audience but somewhere back and crashed and no one was hurt but it just shattered and he continued playing and was asked afterwards why didn't you stop when the chandelier fell and he said, uh, what, what chandelier? I, I don't, I didn't hear anything. And he, <laughs> he shows the complete focus on what he was doing. I would he was love fully it. engaged in so flow engaged. state. Yeah. And also, even if it entered your mind, that's okay. You just let it exit just like it entered. And yeah. that you have no control over that. That's far enough away from you that you're not in personal danger. And just I was going to also... I was, I was also going to say that um, thinking of um, how we evaluate ourselves 
after something is also just crucial um, when you were talking about how you um, analyze what you do afterwards. Um, I just think it's important to, you know, um, go in as confident as you can be, but then also be gentle to yourself. So I know that um, Tim Galway talks about being in the zone. Um, I had to have a piano teacher that I've worked with forever uh, who talks about 80%. And if you can go into, in my case, a concert, in your case, a tournament, playing 80% of your best, that's really great because we can't always achieve the zone, the flow state. We can't always get there. So if you strive for something maybe a little less than perfect, because we're never going to do perfect, um, it, that's a great goal to have going in. And I agree with that. It's 80, 100 rule, you know, mm. I would rather someone play 80% their best 100% of the time than try for 100%. I call that redlining. 100%, 100% of the time is extraordinarily difficult and very risky. Mm -hmm. So playing within yourself is that 80% error. And that's okay. Playing within yourself rather than always playing at 100%. We can't do that at 100%. Yeah. I mean, that is an impossible goal. So I think, you know, if we can learn how to reach for that 80% and again, try to recreate the times when you played your best and the times when you won your golds versus the times you didn't. That's how I think yeah. the best, but it's a lifetime process, which is another thing I love about both sports and music is um, I can coach any world-class pianist they can come and play a program for me. And there's plenty that I could tell them to think about. Um, in, in this case, it's so subjective, but um, it's something that we're all working on forever and we can always improve, which I think is similar to most sports. And I, I agree. I always believe in having a coach and a mentor. I have a mental skills coach and mentor myself. And I'm always learning as a coach. I learn sometimes more from my players than my own knowledge or research. And so it's kind of a combination. And I think the player makes the student better. The student makes the, the, the coach better. And I, I firmly believe that I'm always looking to improve. I think once you stay stagnant and you think you know it all, that's when you should give it up and go do something else. Um, but I want to touch on um, the difference between happiness and joy. It took me many years to figure this out, but when I was D1 college tennis player uh, back then, there wasn't pickleball, you know, really the way it is now. And uh, so I, you know, I, I grew up playing table tennis when I was three at my grandfather's house with my twin brother at, and, you know, I did a lot of racket sports, badminton and tennis, but tennis is what I really was my early passion. And so when I made the team, you know, I was grumpy if I lost a match and I was really happy if I won and I, and, and that's taxing is that, you know, even if you're reading 80% of your matches, that might've been my win rate, you know, there's 20% of the time I wasn't happy. And then years later, when I got paid to coach players and make them feel good. And when they felt good about themselves, they learned more and wanted to play more. So I'd play in a Tuesday night tennis group. This is at Yvonne Lendl's club. Mm -hmm. And I, I played for, happiness or joy but then the look on their face when i would compliment them when they would hit a great shot run up to the net the racket tap the way i do now with the paddle tap and at the end of the night i said i found my joy mm -hmm. it wasn't happiness tied to an outcome the outcome became completely irrelevant of whether or not i had fun that night and that's the way I want to be. Life is short. I want to enjoy every moment on the pickleball court, whether I'm coaching or whether I'm competing. It doesn't matter. Singles or doubles or skinny singles, mixed or men's doubles. If I can go at it with a sense of joy, and I've learned that that comes from within and you allow it to come out, whereas happiness is tied to an external outcome that you have no control over and why are you trying to 
guide your happiness towards something that you cannot control. I can't say it better than that. Yeah. I mean, aren't, aren't we lucky to be able to pursue the things that we care deeply about and um, hopefully have some talent in and have developed high level skills. So I would love for you to kind of end this session by, by, playing a note or a few notes um, for us or a few short pieces, if if you will. Uh, uh, what do you think? Sure. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Let me think. Can you give that. us two. How about, can you give us two pieces? Is that what they're called? Pieces? I, pieces. Yeah. And in, in rock, it's probably rock and roll is more numbers. Um, but uh, I've studied classical music, which in my opinion, can apply to so many other forms of music. So sometimes I play uh, as a substitute for Broadway shows. Um, and I think that sometimes, uh, you know, different genres of a sport overlap too. And it's just great to be able to um, have the appreciation for, for different forms of music or different sports and these all kind of come together so yes i will be glad to play something why don't you why don't you do two pieces and i know you, you like to do a pause just like i like to pause between points or after an yeah. uh, error you know you have your routine or your ritual your ritual tied to superstition but a routine to have that pause in there yeah. um so one piece and then pause oh, no i'll just i'll just play one piece but what i was going to say oh, okay about ritual, um, I don't actually have a before concert yeah. ritual. I ah. don't do because, you know, if there's traffic, if something goes wrong, and yeah. I don't have time to do that ritual, I don't want to be stuck to that and feel like, uh oh, I didn't have a chance to do my breathing. Um, but I do try to, you know, really tell myself I'm prepared, I'm going to have fun, and I'm going to go out there and do my best. And I would uh, say pre preparedness and fun are within your control. And so that is your routine. So routines are drastically different than rituals. So I don't coach rituals because they're based on superstitions that are actually not within your control. So you don't want the traffic to control you. That's a ritual. But there, those two things are, are part of your routine. And mm -hmm. that's brilliant because that's what I do in pickleball too. Absolutely. So thanks for the opportunity to share some of these things. And I hope it's helpful to people who have the desire to uh, pursue a craft, a skill, anything. And that's the thing about all the things, all the disciplines we're talking about, you can enjoy them on any level. And if you do want to pursue something to a really, really high level of excellence, it definitely takes dedication and time and most importantly, enjoyment. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for watching and for listening. Okay. Um.